Hi, Polina. Hi, Edik. So, um, how do we begin? Well, we begin by saying that both of us are musicians. So right. I guess okay. uh, we have uh, lots of things in common and we can talk about uh, musical things, non-musical things, right? Right, I mean... Inspiration. For example, uh, Motivation. Right. right. What drives people to do what they do, I guess. Well, I know one thing for sure is, uh, something that drives people is where they're from, their upbringing. We could start with that. Yeah. Um, you were born in Russia. Mm -hmm. And you said you came from the Volga region, is that correct? Yes, I was born in a small town, an industrial town. Uh, not so small, but compared to Moscow, it's less than a million people, a population. Uh, my, my, uh, the name of my town is Tolietti, uh, and Tolietti is um, the name of uh, Italian communists. So my, 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 uh, my city's name uh, is based off uh, this uh, former communist, uh, Palmiro right. Tolietti who fought against Nazis, so right. it was a very significant name. A uh, beautiful name, Tagliati, I guess, it's Italian, sounds Italian, so many people ask me where it is, right? So people don't know. Even right. people from Russia? Yeah, not so many people know where Tagliati is, actually. Uh, some people know because of the uh, car factory, Vaz car factory. Vaz, yeah, out of Vaz. Out of Vaz, yes. Um, so, yes, I was born and raised there. I lived uh, um, up, up until I was 17 years old, and then I moved to Moscow. So I went to school in Tagliati. Uh, it was a special music school for gifted children. I was very lucky because it was an experimental school. It wasn't an established institution, uh, so, so to say. Um, we have this amazing uh, woman in Tagliati. Her name is Lydia Semyonova. She's a visionary. So when she was my age or even younger, she decided to organize this special music school for kids. Uh, and she recruited seven people, seven kids, uh, with uh, gif gifted kids. So she threw uh, an audition, so, so to say. Uh, and the idea was that every kid would study more than one instrument. So uh, when I was growing up, I played three instruments, uh, piano, flute, and violin. So naturally, I mean, one would have to be able to know several instruments in order to compose. Yes, now I see the value, but you know, when I was growing up, I, I met a lot of critique for that because you know, the stigma is that you have to concentrate on one instrument to become very good at it. You know, no one in Russia would start on the violin and then transfer to cello. This is right. just impossible. I mean, sometimes people will start on the violin and transfer to viola. That's right. much easier. Makes more sense. Yeah, or start on a cello and then transfer to bass, rarely, but it happens because bass is such a big instrument, you can start playing it when you're a child. It's just impossible physically, I'd say. But yeah, um, now I, I feel so lucky that I know three instruments. Uh, and uh, as, of, as I've gotten older, I, I decided to learn more instruments. So I also play accordion. Nice. I, I, I taught myself to do it. I also play a lot of um, different recorders. Uh, I have a tenor recorder at home, a soprano recorder. Like the, the, the woodwind the kind yes, of thing. Yeah, the flute type. Um, and I wanted to learn more instruments. Not to be you know, really great at it, but just to, to have a command for writing. Uh, when I write for orchestra, I find it so useful that I know the woodwind section. Because I, I can think about the, you know, the, if this is a, a comfortable passage to play, is the uh, idiomatic, so to say. You know, right. Idiomatic, is it, will it sound good on the instrument? Most of the time I get it right. <laughs> brass is not so comfortable, but I love the sound of brass, so I don't mind it. Yeah, I've always play. had a difficult time trying to learn how to play like a, like yes, a trumpet. Very or difficult, yes. Yeah, the, the, the technique is just so difficult. So yeah, my upbringing was um, in a small industrial town of Russia and with beautiful nature, so I would often visit the countryside and get inspiration. Um, there because uh, it's just amazing how beautiful um, the Volga region is. Um, my father is a keen um, uh, lover of, of, of travel, so he would uh, travel often back with his backpack. You know, and yeah, the he rivers, would, uh, the mountains, the yeah, mountains, Juguli, Juguli mountains. So um, I guess I was lucky uh, in that regard as well because growing up, I, I was surrounded by beautiful nature. And I, I'm to this day, I'm so drawn to, to nature, you know, when I feel. Uh, that not enough inspiration is in my heart or in my head, I go out and I go hiking. And this helps a lot as a composer. Um, when did you first start uh, playing music? How old are you and uh, what was the first instrument? So it was, actually, it was a miraculous story. My mom keeps telling me this story, but I don't know if I should believe it. But the, the story, the family stories that I started when I was two years old. And uh, my first thing that I, uh, piece that I played was 
a final scene from Glinka's opera, Жизнь за царя. So it was um, this one. So uh, that was the first thing that I played with my two hands. And um, the thing is that um, both of my, my siblings were playing this piece, but they were playing it for hands, learning this piece together, and they are older than, than I. So I picked it up by uh, just listening to it. And then I figured out how to play it myself at two years old. I don't know if, if to believe it or not. And since then, my mom, <laughs> She did so much. She, she, you know, she would find best teachers for me, all the opportunities. So I'm very grateful for her support. And we didn't have money. You know, it was a very difficult time because uh, it was perestroika time, so around the 90s, in a, in a small town. It wasn't even Moscow. Taliati had some difficult times in the 90s. Uh, you know, also crime and uh, poverty. Uh, my mom had to sacrifice a lot to, to give me this education. Not because it was very expensive, but just also time consuming and also buying instruments. For instance, a violin is a very, it's a good violin, it's ex an expensive instrument. Oh, yeah, so. a cheap cello is not exactly cheap. Exactly, you know. exactly. Like so even the cheapest cello would cost, you know, like a thousand. sacrifice and, you know, kind of making a choice. Are we eating a good, sophisticated meal or are we saving the money? So I was lucky to have the support from the family, I guess, uh, from the very early age. So yeah, I was two years old when I started playing. And then you didn't stop? No, I didn't, never. Just I just felt that I found myself, you know, some people search for what they want to do for their entire life. And um, I was given this notion that I'm a musician. Uh, of course, you know, I, I kind of um, I switched from being a violinist, full-time violinist, you know, after uh, starting on, on the piano, actually, I started playing violin seriously and uh, I studied and practice a lot and I went to the best schools. So I was actually, uh, my trajectory of my career was to become a violinist, but then I branched out into composition. You know, the most natural thing for me as a child was to compose and express myself through music, through composition. So it's almost like you never even made a transition. You already kind of knew from the very beginning what you wanted. Yes. And like you said before, there are people saying, no, 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 you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. But you're like, nope. I'm gonna do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't easy because you know, in in a small town like Taliati, people didn't understand what it is to be to be a composer. So they uh, said you have to become a very good violinist or whatever pianist. And I'm grateful because because uh, because I, I I got to play uh, on a professional level. I I then moved to Moscow and then I met my teacher, composition teacher. But I I kept composing. You know, no matter what would happen, you know, like when my parents would fight, I would then jump on the piano and play some dramatic music, and my mom would ask me to stop because that music was breaking her heart. You know, so I was <laughs> expressing myself as a little girl through music. Uh, I'm grateful that you know I I didn't start composing professionally till I was, say, 17 years old, you know, kind of late. But for a composer, it's nothing. You know, being a 17 years old composer is still yeah, very, exactly, very young. Yeah. But, you know, some people start earlier. Some like, people start very late, too. As well, yeah, and that's nothing is wrong with it. Right. I mean, no matter how early or late your start is, if this makes you happy, that's great. Right. There's, it's, it's immortality, that's the thing. Exactly. Once you make a piece, that's it. it that's true. It's there forever. Yeah, but also I think the most important thing is the, what makes you happy, you know, at the end. I mean, who are we to judge if our music or whatever we do will stay here? I mean, in the moment, what's important is for us to, to be happy as a, as a person, as, a, as people. Because if we are happy, there will be less terrible things in the world. It's a sort of happiness that I can't really say is like, oh, ha ha, nice smiles. It's more like a kind of knowing your time and place in the world and everything is just, you know, in order. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, it's a very good way to put it. When you compose, do you usually start with the pen or do you start with the instrument? I usually start, with, you know, the ideas in my head, the image that I have, mm -hmm. um, and then somehow it translates into music. I'm a very old school, as you can see, uh, the, you know, the rhythm notes <laughs> like that. So I usually start by sketching out some ideas, um, sitting in the, uh, on the piano. Oh, you sketch it out on, mm -hmm. onto the music notation first, or you said you had an image. Yes, in is my it, head. Is that an image or is that notes? 
I would say it's an image actually, an yeah. image more uh, more than the actual melody. Sometimes melodies come, you know, but uh, more often it's the image or a feeling that I want to convey, and then I, I think about this and I channel some magical wires. And it reminds me, yeah, synesthesia. Yeah, and synesthesia, some, like some when you, hear yeah, when you hear uh, color or you can taste music. Right. Yeah, I have this with images for sure. Uh, and then I write down uh, whatever, you know, the image dictates the music, I would say. And then um, after this is, this is done, I, I put it in a, in a computer. I manually um, insert the notes into the software. I print it out and I give it to, to musicians. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very old school way of doing it, you know, mm -hmm. because most of my colleagues, they produce also. Mm, they produce a nice uh, ready-to-go composition that could be played on the radio or, you know. That must be an amazing feeling because... You just print it out, and then immediately, any orchestra that has enough skill could just do it. That's true. Yes, that's the best. You know, I remember the first time I heard my music played by a quartet, string quartet. I was the happiest person on, on this planet. Were you there? Yes, I, I printed out. Actually, it wasn't even printed. I, I wrote it down. <laughs> I didn't have. A, I was still very, very young. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have a printer. But I still could, could write the notes for my friends to play, and they played for me. It was so beautiful. Just the feeling that my thoughts, you know, I had an image and now it is uh, a real thing. People can play it. And what was the first time you composed a piece for a full orchestra? For full orchestra? Uh, for a big one? Yeah. Uh, it was actually already here in the States when I was at the Yale School of Music. I had this incredible opportunity to write for a big... Uh, uh, orchestra that we have, Yale Philharmonia. It's a very fantastic orchestra, you know, the best young musicians from the, all around the world come to the school. And um, it was sort of a, a thesis project for me. Um, uh, at the end of my master's degree, I, I had to write a big orchestral piece, but it happened to be my first one. You know, I, of course, before that, I was writing a lot of string orchestra pieces, but that was the first big orchestral piece. So I was already you know, 21 years old. So. Um, pretty late, I'd say, but that piece, um, the name of that piece is Winter Bells. I was lucky enough to work with the uh, recording engineer, his name is Eugene Kimball. And of course the orchestra played so well and the conductor was my dear friend, so I had to, I had an opportunity to talk uh, with the conductor a lot uh, about the, how to play this piece, you know, and the result was so successful that um, the recording that I, I've got from the concert, of course the concert was a big success as well, but the recording, uh, I was able to send it to some orchestras uh, around the world, and um, this piece then was played by many, many great orchestras, including Russian National Orchestra. They also recorded it on a Sony uh, music label.
That's in amazing. 2010. Yeah. So it was fantastic. So I built a relationship with the orchestra, which is one of the best in Russia. Uh, so thanks to that piece, that very first orchestral piece. There was another one I think was called uh, Haim. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's. I would. I would be curious as to how much of a role uh, religion or like matters of the spirit would play in, I guess, not even just your work, but also your life? Uh, it's a very good question, and I don't have a, a definite answer to that. You know, I am um, I'm not baptized. I, I don't follow any religion, so I'd say I'm not religious, but I'm definitely spiritual. Um, I feel a deep connection to the divine, I would say, you know, I... So it's a big role in my life, but it's, you know, so intimate, so I don't really know even how to talk about this, you know. It's, I never talk to anybody about my beliefs, I'd say, so I keep it very, very private, but it's uh, one of the most important driving forces in my music. Um, you know, if we would speak about this philosophically, it's about the idea uh, for the better world, I'd say, and um, this, the power of the spirit, you know, how, how we are um, able to become better as a human being, and this desire to become better through spirituality, I'd say, is one of the questions that I'm uh, constantly thinking about. Right, I, I tended to see that a lot, um, a, a balance between harmony and uh, dissonance. Yeah. And it just kind of, I love how seamlessly it just blends in and out. Like one, like not even, like uh, two measures pass, and it's just kind of a noise, and then whoosh, all of a sudden, like it sweeps in, like like the wind a bit. That I'm talking about the harmony that mm -hmm. sweeps in. Thank you. You said that you want to pick up more instruments. Mm -hmm. What well, one would that be next? Uh, I have a commission that I have to write for guitar, and um, you know I'm not such a crazy lover of classical guitar for some reason. Oops. Sorry, guitar. <laughs> the guitar, <laughs> the guitar doesn't love you either. <laughs> Sorry. So that's my next instrument that I will try to learn, despite the, my difficult relationship with it. Um, although I've met a fantastic virtuoso guitar player who actually is turning my head around the instrument. He can do everything. Like right. he plays so beautifully, and I, I just love the sound of his playing. So maybe. My, my idea is to, to write for him a guitar concerto, so, but for that I will have to definitely learn how to play. If you agree that there is an element of storytelling or not, um, what do you usually imagine when you move, go from movement to movement, if that makes any sense? Of course, and such a great question because there's a divide. You know, people, um, since the uh, late 19th century, there was this big divide if the music is programmatic, like, you know, with a story, with a, a concrete story behind it, you know, so you kind of can, can follow this, the story and the music reflects the story, or it's absolute music. So just, you know, pure music, just um, abstract images. I don't know, I'm somewhere in, in between, to be honest, you know, I, I don't feel like I have a particular story that I follow, but I'm, um, some of my pieces are inspired by a true life story. For instance, Chaim that you mentioned, um, this piece is uh, inspired by the life uh, of a Holocaust survivor, David Arben. And, uh, you know, after reading about his life, I, uh, the music just reflects his life, you know, literally from when he was a child, then he went through these terrible, unspeakable things, you know, in the, in, the, in the camps, and then he survived. And there was a moment of, of joy and happiness, but then still never to the fullest, because, you know, after living through such hell, uh, one could not be just naive and, and joy, joyous again. So the piece really just depicts his life, I would say. So that's why in that piece, uh, I also used a lot of extended techniques and in playing inside of the piano. It, it sounds like a bombs, you know, in the distance. Or you can do also this. So all sorts of weird, weird, crazy stuff. Um, but that was not just because, you know, for the sake of originality or something. It was to, to depict, in a way, a ve very literally, the story behind the, my piece. So yeah, I, I guess I'm in, be, in between of programmatic music and absolute music.
Have you ever done an, an opera? Yes, I do have an opera. Uh, it's based on uh, Pushkin's fairy tale, Snow White. In, in Russian, it's uh, a tale of uh, the Snow White and Seven uh, Nights, Mighty Nights. Сказка мертвой царевне и семи богатырях. Um, it was a fun project. It's a chamber or orchestra, uh, orchestra, so it's about six, seven people in orchestra. So not, not even an orchestra, it's a chamber ensemble and a bunch of singers, uh, 12 singers. More uh, singers than instrument yeah, players, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, well, uh, there's a, uh, an opportunity to expand the orchestra. I mean, if all, it's just one, um, one instrument per, you know, string, one, one violin, one uh, viola, one cello, but I can just expand it and make it a string section. Uh, so 12 violinists. 12 years would not be bad, actually it will be better. So it's like, a, a, you know, in a, in a nutshell, what I will do with instrumentation. Uh, so yeah, that opera is very special for me because uh, I wrote it in a very short amount of time, maybe four months. And the piece is one hour and 20 minutes long, so it's pretty long. And it was uh, done in Boston, five times in Boston, then four times in New York. So it was actually successful. The, the opera is in Russian, but American people loved it. Because the story is so familiar to everybody. I had the evil mom, you know, evil, right, evil right. queen. And I decided that the title character will be a mezzo-soprano, you know, because not so many roles are for mezzo-sopranos, usually the soprano who is the star. And the, my main character is the evil queen, first of all. She's an evil character, and she's a central character. I, I gave her all sorts of fantastic areas to sing. That's and, awesome. Yeah, so I loved writing it. I wish I'll have another opportunity to write opera. My dream, of course, is uh, the opera to be done in Russia you know, because uh, the story is so familiar and that I, I'm also using the text by Pushkin, so so many people know it by heart because they've been hearing it since they were children. Right. Vietir, vietir, te maguish, te ganiesh, te etuch. It's all, um, people will probably sing along, right? Not even knowing the music, but the, the words are so powerful. Have you ever done any uh, work for film? Well, I've done some indie films, uh, not nothing, you know, big blockbustery yet. I would not mind actually doing something big. Uh, my initial idea of moving to the States was to, to become a composer for Hollywood, of course. You know, it was my dream. Uh, I wanted to write for films, but then I, I kind of got into the classical music and I loved it so much, so I decided to stay here and things are going so well. I don't want to move to LA, you know, and start over. Right. I mean, I could really imagine you doing something for, let's say, like uh, Daniel Aronofsky. Mm -hmm. You ever watch yeah. any of his films, like no, Pi, no. Black Swan? Oh, Black Swan I watched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a very powerful film. All of his yeah. movies are yeah. very, like, grotesque or mm -hmm. very heavy subjects. They mm -hmm. deal with, like, Requiem for a Dream. Uh -huh. also him. Yeah, yeah I'd, love to, I'd love to do something like this. It's just a matter of finding that, that one person who believes in your music, I guess. Right. Because the competition is very fierce, you know, all the composers in the Hollywood, they, they're so good and it's wonderful. There is a lot of nepotism too, where yeah. you have to know somebody. Oh, yes. It's yes. a club, you, have to, they, you don't try to join the club, they only invite you in. Yes. And that's how, that's, that's how it always is with the mm -hmm. creative industries. Yes, but also it, it is like that in, in many uh, fields, not right. even only in Hollywood, but also in classical music is the, like that. Right. But uh, I think the most important thing is just to, to be the best you can in, in the profession, to be really good, and then some, some good stuff will happen, but also uh, be out there, so not to hide your music or any way. Like my, I tell my students you should upload your music, you know, I sh you should 
get great recordings, you have to send it out there just to be visible as a composer. Because right. You will not believe how many composers they just don't show, don't share their music at all. And probably the greatest, you know, of anybody, like all the greatest artists. Somebody there could be somebody sitting there, you know, mm. and it would just go away. Nobody gets to hear it right. because they just never show it. I mean, yeah. I've never actually uploaded a single piece of music yet. No. And what makes you uh, not do that? Or do you think that's it's not good enough? Or it is a sense of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Also, like um, I will eventually release it, but I want it to be like a package, you know, mm -hmm. like a like a concept, like an album, mm -hmm. instead of just like one song at a time. I want it. Mm -hmm. I want people to to look at it um, as a sequence, mm -hmm. or like as a a forest and not so much a single tree, mm -hmm. you know. But then you also have to understand that once you release it, you'll have to produce another one rather quickly because right. if you produce one thing and then, like uh, being an artist of just one album is not really good, right? So you have to. So I would advise maybe at least some previews, you know, like te tease people, like uh, make sure that they will expect this. You know, it's not like, oh, here's the new album, but there's so much, right? So how do you become desirable as an artist? So I guess being out there is important. It's like, it should be a natural desire to be an artist, to be a creator. No one will, will force you to do this because there's so many people who really wanted to be an artist and they're doing it. So if you're not sure. Most of the time, yeah. it's not, no one's going to force you to be an artist. Most of the time, people tell you not to well, do exactly. it. Exactly. And they have the reasons, right? I mean. It's not practical. It's, but you know, who cares? I mean, if this makes you happy, if this is the one thing that you want to do with your life, do it. And be good at it. So be the best you can. That's my advice. And it's important to perfect your craft. And that's what I tell, uh, tell my students. The craft is important. Right. And I think, you know, how would you say you would incorporate poetry into your music? Well, I write a lot of songs, to be honest. It's, a, it's an art song. It's not a pop song, so I have a, a singer and a piano. I usually, with sometimes, sometimes I write uh, for singer and orchestra. So I literally set the poem to music, literally, as a song. So I take the poem and then I make it a song. That's how I incorporate the poetry at this point. Maybe later I'll do something else, something that is, you know, the poem is just read. But that, I mean, the music is kind of independent to the poem, but maybe reflects the poem. But I really love writing on the poetry. This is my favorite thing to do, is to take a great poetry, a poetic piece and then make it a song. Have you ever considered writing a pop song? I would love to do that, yes. I don't have it yet, but I would oh, you, love to. Oh, you haven't started? Mm. Oh, I thought you had maybe like No, a, oh. but I want to. I really want to, but I need good, good lyrics. I cannot just do anything. I, I want good lyrics, no matter the style. I don't care the style, but the lyrics should be good. I mean, I'll show you my the music that we've made so far, yeah. and it's all pretty much it's pop, like nice. done in the, like the kind of like that 80s, 1980s mm -hmm. sort of style. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny because our process is it's very much like we start off with words, we write poetry, and then we like think to ourselves, okay, how are we going to t turn these words and put make them into music to transform them into music? Mm -hmm. We go through that process, and then the next thing we do is we erase the words. Hmm. And then we have to write new words on top of that music. Wow. And that, I think, I mean, for some of our songs, we're actually very proud of like, some of the stuff we've made as a result of this process. Very interesting. Do you have any projects you're currently working on at the moment? Yes, I'm very excited about the project that I'm working on now. It's uh, my first ballet, and it's in collaboration with a genius choreographer from France. His name is Pascal Rioux. And he discovered my music. He wanted to um, commission me this work because he discovered my music through a Pulitzer Prize winner composer who was my mentor at Yale. I'm grateful because you know, because of that connection, you know, I, I, I I've scored this fantastic project, and now um, it's going to be premiered at the Joyce Theater at the end of May. The end of May in the Joyce Theater. The Joyce Theater. Yeah. The James Joyce Theater. And where is it going to be? Where is uh, the in Joyce? Chelsea. In Chelsea. Chelsea. Oh, in here in New York. Mm -hmm. And it's going to run for seven days. Uh, and the dancers are amazing, and the choreographer is just a genius. So he's inspired by Tarkovsky. Tarkovsky is his I favorite. I love Tarkovsky. Oh my god! Yeah. So my the name of my ballet is Nostalgia. Oh yikes! That's amazing. <laughs> I have to see this. Yeah, please come. Please I have come. to see this. Yeah. Like Tarkovsky is my favorite director. Fantastic. So you, then you'll like the. Stalker is my favorite movie, and also of the composer too. Ar 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 
So that's my current project and it's a, it's a big one because the piece is uh, 30 minutes long and uh, it's for a full production. So we have, it's going to be played live. So it will be uh, live musicians playing and the dancers dancing and we'll have some imagery from Darkovsky's film and costumes and everything will be spectacular, hopefully. I just finished that last week, you know, the piece I was providing section by section because the piece is so heavy and important. So I was um, submitting, you know, 10 minutes of music like every two, three months to the choreographer. And we've done two sections at this point. It will be three sections in the, in the piece. And um, he just got the third section last week and he went off to friends in Italy to uh, a European tour with the company. So he's listening in the headphones for this new material that I provided. And uh, I'd love to show you some stuff from it. You know, I, I was, it's the third section of the piece. And you know, in, in the first two sections, there were so many ideas, so much stuff that uh, it was hard to summarize the whole thing in the third section, you know, and so it took me a long time to, to finish it. Um, one thing that I do in that section is that I mix uh, chant, almost like, uh, church chant, you know, Russian Orthodox church chant, and uh, some clusters, some like banging in the piano. And the idea behind this is that after the second section is ended, and the second section is about space, you know, about desire for a better world, but in space, you know, this weird idea that my choreographer had. In so space. In space, yeah. So it's right. a little bit, you know, uh, inspired by uh, uh, Solaris. Solaris, and, uh, right. It, it, there's that yeah. whole thing with the with the planet, yes. the planet is uh, conscious. Right, so well, the I second guess that's section. a spoiler, you don't, you're not supposed to know that <laughs> right. the, the planet's the one making everybody in the ship go crazy. Yeah, we don't know, right? We right. don't know what's, what's happening. So in the, the third section starts with this um, kind of, you know, very traditional progression. Right? Mm -hmm. But on top of this, I have, so this is the strings. I have the pianist go. It goes into this craziness, and then it can then collapse. And then I have, um, I call it <laughs> a disco beat. <laughs> disco so, beat, oh yeah. Don't you, don't you, don't you, don't you, yeah. You know, like something like this, and and then it goes into <laughs> this, uh, you know, Alexander Vertinsky style of. <laughs> like this, right, right, you know, right, yeah. cheap <laughs> uh, walls. It's, it's amazing. Uh, that's that's, so a, that's a great like blend of everything, this, like all the kitsch and all the elegance. Yeah, kitsch, uh, and also this good. conceptual stuff. Yeah, it so all comes together. The, the third section is you know, very heavy with that stuff. But it's all, uh, basically, it's a summation of what came before that. You know, it's not just out of nowhere. I have this thing and then, it, strangely, it summarizes the whole, the whole piece in a way. That's very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I guess seeing it as like an answer to like kind of like the this 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 postmodern where everything has been done, mm. everything's permissive, you know, nothing's forbidden. Yeah, it's it's great. I, I would love to see it. Thank you. Please come. It's gonna it's gonna be hopefully good. Do you work on uh, one project at a time, or do you? Oh, uh, I try to be focused in this regard. You know, I, I do I do a lot of teaching as well, so I have a teaching career uh, on top of my composition career. So basically, two projects that I'm working is my you know uh, teaching uh, very seriously, and then this big ballet at the moment. But uh, before the ballet, I've done uh, my first symphony. I wrote a big symphonic piece, and uh, that was premiered last year in Minnesota. Four movement, huge orchestral piece. And after that piece, I had a bunch of smaller ones, and um, including the sonata for solo violin. And it will be premiered three days before the ballet. So I'll fly to California, and then three days later, I'll have my ballet. So pretty packed schedule at this Excellent. point. Excellent. And then you know, future projects, hopefully, some, some exciting things as well. The cool thing about it is that you, if there's nothing going on, you just think of something. You just make something up. For sure. Well, it's important to know that uh, your music will be heard at some point. And for me, it's important to be able to share my music. I have this desire to be heard. Uh, it's like, you know, in the forest, if the, if, if the branch falls. Right, and no one's around to yes. listen, does it make Did a sound? It, yes. That's the so, Zen. Yeah. The koan. There's also another one. Yeah. Uh, what's the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> um, and uh, actually, I have an answer for that yeah. one. The sound of one hand clapping. 
<laughs> so there's a clapping. <laughs> you say gravitas. Now, this is an important concept for you, yes? Generally, as a career. Uh, yes. Yes. Now, how, how does one go about cultivating uh, mm. gravitas? I think there are several elements, but the most important one is to become really great at what you do. If you're really fantastic at what you do, you will gain the gravitas no matter what. No matter what people will say, you know, doesn't matter. You know, I have a lot of critique to, to my work, a lot of critique. Uh, several uh, things are being criticized, you know, even my gender sometimes, you know, she's a, she's a girl, she can't write. <laughs> no serious composers are female. I don't care. Really, Excellent. deeply. Because I, I love what I do and I'm good at it. That's it. And it's not like I'm good and I'm happy and I will just, you know, enjoy the, you know, почивать на лаврах. No. I will, I will kick my ass to become better and better every day. I'm never satisfied 100%. Uh, it's always something that I could have done better, but I know that I tried very hard and this is as close as perfection as I can get it, you know, in terms of just the creation. And then it depends on my colleagues, my uh, musicians, to execute my music in the best possible way. And I, I'll help them by providing really good music, you know, the written music that is easy to read. So it's my job to make it playable, you know, both will sound good, will look good, easy to read. So basically, Gravitas comes from being a professional, let's say. There's this quote I read once, and I don't remember where it's from. As much as you talk about pieces that you have to show to people, how many pieces are there that you will never want to show to anybody? There are so many. What's the ratio? Is there? Is, there, is it like a one to two of pieces, let's say there's for every, is it like for every two pieces that you don't show, there's one you do? For every uh, two pieces you do show, there's one you don't? Mm -hmm. What's, uh, what's the uh, proportion? The proportion is towards the, I show more than I should have probably, but I'd say um, for every 10 pieces that I show, there's one that I would never show. So there's some secret pieces that no one ever heard. So that's a sort of boldness then maybe that you have. Uh, I think that's actually a good way of judging a person's personality. Mm -hmm in a way, uh, or at least a creator. Um, how open are you to the world? Yeah, you have to be um, brave, I'd say. And there's a bravery element of that, you know. And be vulnerable as well, you know, exposing your art to the world. It's not so easy, but if it's a natural desire, you know, it's like, you know, I want to drink uh, water. This, it's a need, it's nothing, a necessity. Exactly. There's nothing to be ashamed of, right? If you think, if you deeply feel that you have something to share, just become a professional, you know, in one way or another. I loved what you said about, you know, being profoundly bad, that I love it. If this is on purpose. Yes, if it's not done out of helplessness, then that's good. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's like some element, because like, yes, I do like to purposefully make really bad music. Yeah. And I actually have some of it recorded on my phone. I can show it to you. Mm -hmm. um, there is also, also kind of a sense of helplessness because I think of it as like a sense of protest. Mm -hmm. I see so much music out there that's make, that's really popular and really bad. And you know, I look at myself and I'm like, I never want to do anything like this. So I try to copy the stuff mm -hmm. that I see out there that's popular and really bad. Mm -hmm. You know. To, to laugh at it, because I see myself, you know, these are these giants out there, and I'm just this, you know, you know, just this David running around with like a little, you know, uh, what's it called, you know, like David and Goliath, like he has the sling mm -hmm. with the rock in it. This means just trying to poke them in the eye. Yes, but um, there are different ways you can do this, right? You can mock them in a more positive outlook, I'd say, because, you know, think, thinking like this is a little bit, and there is nothing wrong with it, but it's just, um, I would be uh, sick if I would feel like this, you know, that I'm no one and they're great. Well, not great, but they don't deserve the place that they are. I, I try to avoid those thoughts. Of course, they cross my mind sometimes right. and because there are composers who are very famous and I don't know why, to be honest. Uh, but I try to cultivate the, you know, the positive. I mean, for me, that's space. one way I do it is through the humor. It's like, That's oh, great. Yeah, humor is yeah. the answer, you know? Right. Um, I guess we must be running out of time. Yes. Um, is there anything you want to tell our viewers, you know, specifically, you know, if you want to make some closing statements in the court of public opinion? 
uh, I guess, follow your dreams no matter how hard it is and no matter what people will tell you. Uh, if you hear your friends or parents saying being an artist is uh, a bad choice, don't believe them. If uh, being an artist is what makes you happy, you cannot live without it, then do it. Do it, you know, find every possible opportunity out there to become an artist. It was very nice talking to you, Polina. Very nice talking to you. Thank you. <laughs>